and on Christmas Eve, okay? My uncle kicked us out, 1984, Christmas Eve. I was in that little truck, it was snowing. Right now, me and my wife, we own two triplex in New York City, uh, about 100, close to 100 units in Northern Kentucky, and also close to 100 units in Charleston. And uh, also, I just bought some land in Taiwan. I gave my wife to buy a, a condo because she uh, always wanted to own something in Japan. Then accidentally, I found out the interest is like... When Isaac Chang immigrated to the US from Taiwan with his family, I don't think he could have imagined he would be owning a real estate portfolio of 170 units today. In 1984, he and his family immigrated to New Jersey from Taipei with very little money. But today, he's a very successful real estate investor who has retired from his corporate job with this multiple six-figure cash flow from his real estate portfolio. So in this video, Isaac is going to talk about his real estate investing journey and how he built a portfolio of 170 units in the US and built a real estate empire with his wife. Whether you want to get your real estate investing journey started or scale your business to the next level, you're not gonna wanna miss this. And later in this video, we'll discuss why he's shifting his focus onto Asian markets, including Japan, and where in Japan he's looking to invest next. Before we dive into the interview, if you haven't already, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe to this channel. It really helps the channel grow and I would really appreciate it. And also, I have a gift for you. If you're interested in how to buy an Akia cheap abandoned house in Japan, as as a foreigner. I put together a step-by-step -step guide that will help you own your dream house here in Japan, whether you're looking to have a second home or start your rental portfolio. Be sure to click the link below in the description. Now, enjoy my interview with Isaac. All right, Isaac, welcome to my channel and I'm so excited to talk to you today. Thank you for your time and sharing your wisdom and experience on real estate investing. Thank you, Shio, for the invite. I really appreciate it. Yeah, so I know that you have, let's just get right into it. I know you have a bunch of properties all across the U.S. and also all over the world. But can you can you tell me, um, you know, what what your portfolio looks like right now? Well, uh, right now, um, uh, me and my wife, you know, she wanted to say, uh, you know, us, right? So me and my wife, we own uh, uh, two triplex in New York City, and. Uh, um, about a uh, hundred, uh, about a hundred, close to hundred units in Northern Kentucky. It's across the river from Cincinnati, and also close to hundred units in uh, Charleston. And uh, also, I just bought some land in Taiwan, um, and uh, uh, I'm looking to buy some, purchase some land in Phnom Penh, Cambodia as well. Wow, oh, that's exciting! And you just came back uh, to the U.S. Uh, from Japan, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. We, we went for a summer vacation to uh, Taiwan, Japan, and Cambodia. You know, we wanted to, uh, you know, everywhere I go, I try to see the real estate. You know, we, for the first time, I looked at the Japanese uh, multifamily real estate, which was, uh, you know, uh, very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's awesome. Well, this is my first time interviewing someone online. Um, I know you're based in New York, New York City. Yeah, uh, in Flushing, Queens. Queens, okay. And uh, we couldn't meet up, so we're doing this on, on Zoom. Um, but, you know, you have, I think you have a really ex interesting and unique and really inspiring story of how you got started. So that's like, what, like almost 200 units or something across many markets, right? So how, how did you get started in real estate investing? What's your story like? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm very fortunate. You know, I retired that in 2019, actually right into the COVID. But, um, you know, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, I, I went to uh, Hawaii for eight days and then I realized, man, you know, there is, uh, you know, more things I wanted to do. But uh, how, as far as how I got re uh, started, uh, if I can just show the screen real quick. Yeah, please. Because uh, I, I taught uh, I taught this stuff in uh, my university, University of Southern California, for about two years. Yeah. So during the uh, pandemic, uh, the professor, uh, uh, the department head, uh, asked me that uh, you know, as alum, can you come back and uh, teach the real world uh, of business uh, to our students because the whole school was shutting down. So I, I put up something real quick, uh, you know, cracking the code of financial freedom, how I did it in, you know, approximately 10 years, you know, um, and 
So I started uh, after graduation. You know, I started uh, in IT. Uh, I did. Um, I was in the semiconductor business. Uh, I own a small IT firm in in Dubai uh, for seven years, and I sold the company. Uh, this is my crew and my customers, and uh, the uh, you know the semiconductor that we 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 produce. Uh, Okay, Bluetooth has said this was back in the days, right? So I was even on the PC magazine and Windows magazine several times, and this is the article back in 2006. Um, yeah, but uh, you know, in technology, things change very, very fast, and uh, you know, in 2007, uh, everything come to a halt because of Lehman Brothers, right? All the business collapse and everything, and then you know, I was, you know, I. Uh, I don't know, I didn't know how what the future is going to be like, so I sold my business and then I took the money and I, re uh, I started uh, my own real estate management firm. Uh, but in uh, real quick, uh, so I immigrated, I'm jumping a little bit, but I was uh, came to the States when I was 14, uh, lived in the basement for 10 years, graduated from MBA in 2000, and then I worked in small size, mid size, and Fortune 500 companies and also New York City government and even started my own technology firm, which is the one I showed you. And then I founded my uh, own uh, uh, real estate holding firm, okay, and retired at 49. This is the, uh, the photos of the uh, properties uh, my wife and I own. This is New, New York City. Okay, see, in New York City, it's very difficult to evict tenants. As uh, Shu, you know, we talked about it. Um, and I had a lot of you know terrible experiences uh, because my my mom didn't speak English, so I was always the one that went to the court to evict tenants. And then I had this guy, my tenant, came in to the court and start sobbing, you know, my life, my life, my business, and all that. And then the judge, you know, listened intently, and then you know gave him uh, another three months, you know, uh, for free. So I vowed to myself I would never invest in another blue state. Then I started uh, investing in Texas from seven units to 23 in uh, Ohio, uh, Cincinnati, and then Northern Kentucky. This is the 36 unit, I, uh, you know, my fourth project. And then I was able to refi and purchase the 48 units. Okay, these two are um, right next to the uh, Amazon uh, Prime Air Park. Okay, so there's uh, plenty of jobs. And then I thought I needed to diversify, so I went south where the Sun Belt is. That's where the movements were. You know, uh, a lot of the baby boomers were moving to the south to Florida, Texas, and the Carolinas. Um, this is uh, uh, 80 units um, near Charleston. Uh, it's a right to work state, uh, you know, uh, the Volvo, Mercedes Benz and uh, BMW, they, they make cars there. So there's uh, plenty of jobs, now they're developing EV cars. So I mean, you know, it, it's, it's a guess rich slow uh, method, you know, because the first two, one or two years, you know, you got to stabilize the property and then when it stabilizes, I mean today, you know, it takes me, you know, uh, an hour a week, you know, I don't, you know, so it, it's, it's really a very, very good time for me right now. And, you know, one of the reasons, you know, I went through a lot of different companies, you know, small, big, and my own company, and I realized, you know, with, you know, the U.S. government, they all are Keynesians, right, meaning that they print a lot of money, okay, I study into the history, and then that's all they do during pandemic. They printed seven trillion with a T. Okay, I mean, you know, I mean, how how are you gonna work and then you know uh, be able to keep up? Okay, so that's the young people today, right? They graduate, they can't buy a house, da da da, you know. So you look at this, right? Um, the red section, okay, that's the whole red section. That's the bottom 50% of the economy. Our average income is $60,000, okay, in America per household. And this is 50%, okay? And then you have the next 30% right here, okay? 
So that's 80%, it's almost the whole pie that making uh, 95K and below, okay? And then you have the next 10% that makes between 100 and 200,000, 250,000. That's the top 10%. And then you have the 1%, right? That makes half a million to, to a mil. And then you have the 0.0%, that's that thing right there. See that? That's a million dollars a year, right there, that little thing. Okay, so most of the people are in the poverty line, okay, and that's very alarming. And you know, everything is going up because due to inflation, except our salary. And here is a quick synopsis of what's happening with US dollar. US dollar is going down, okay, and the green line is gold. Gold is going steadily up. And then in the middle is the Chinese currency, Yuan. It's totally steady. The Chinese government is in the back, holding it, okay? But US dollar, it's in serious crisis. You look at this. China prepares to launch the first e-currency for the world, okay? The BRICS, right? You know, uh, the BRICS. Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. They are not using a dollar anymore. So it's really important, this is my favorite movie by the way, Shu, The Founder. Uh, if you haven't seen it, you gotta see it. Uh, this is my last slide, by the way. McDonald is the business of real estate, right? McDonald is not in the business of burgers, it's real estate. And when the government keeps printing money, I'm in the business of debt, okay? When the debt is cheap, borrow as much as possible. That's the secret sauce to building your own business. When now the debt is high, you stop. But you want to fix long-term debt and sit back and chill because inflation is going to reduce the debt for you. Here you go. Awesome. No, thank you. Thank you. No, it's interesting because my, my wife and I just talked about uh, the founder movie or that line that you just talked about. McDonald's uh, is, not a, is not a fast food company or it is but it's in the business of real estate that's you know they secure the the most desired locations all over the world right and they buy them they own them and they just happen to be selling hamburgers and fries and you know that's how they make income but how they are building wealth equity is actually real estate right <clears throat> they don't teach you that in school yeah, right they don't they yeah don't. yeah that's awesome thank you yeah financial freedom is such a big topic that you know um, a lot of my audience you know wants to know more about and real estate you know from my experience as well is a great way to build wealth it's not a rich get uh, get rich quick scheme right um, so for those who have the patience for those who work really hard uh, especially in, in the beginning right because the, the progress the, the uh, it takes a long time to get started and get the momentum but once you get the momentum you know, it, it can be very fast and it can, the, the force can be really, really fast, really powerful and compounds, right? Right, right, yeah, because you got to know how to use debt. Yeah. You yeah. got you to gotta know how to choose the location and use debt to get rich. Yeah. That's how I yeah. started from zero to 200. Yeah. And you kind of glossed over your childhood. So you moved to the U.S., uh, when you were 14, right? So tell me more and that you you were living in the basement for 10 years I know. So tell, no, tell me more like about your, your your upbringing. What was that like because you know every time I talk um, You know the past interviews that I've done I get a lot of comments saying like well these you know these guys had rich fathers or rich families um, You know they they were well off so they of course they got into real estate and succeeded, but that's not the case uh, for the people that I interviewed and I know for you as well. So can you tell can you tell us a little bit about your up, Upbringing, what was that like moving to the US? Yeah, so to make a long story short, my dad was an interpreter In Taiwan, he interprets both Japanese English. Oh, well and Chinese, right? So in 1984 when he came here, he found out he doesn't have a job because they don't need interpreters right um, but in Taiwan he gets very you know he gets paid very well 
So he basically dropped me and my mom and my brother off, and then, you know, uh, I, we started, we, 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 initially we lived in with my grandpa, and then he went right back to Taiwan, and barely showed up, okay, in my life, in my teenage life. My grandpa was a doctor, uh, but unfortunately after four, uh, four months, he had cancer and passed away, and then my relative, you know, uh, my, my brother's siblings, they, uh, they were fighting over the, uh, you know, the, 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 what is it, the inheritance. And then we got kicked out. My father never showed up, so he didn't, didn't get much. So we moved. So my mom didn't speak much English, took both of us. Uh, we were living in Paramus, New Jersey. And then on Christmas Eve, okay, I still remember, my uncle kicked us out, 1984, Christmas Eve. I was in that little truck, it was snowing, and then, you know, and then I came to New York City, and then it was like, it was like a dump, right? You know, that back then, flushing was not safe, you know, graffitis, and, uh, you know, Paramus was a uh, upper middle class. So then, to make things worse, we went to the basement, okay? And in New York, when you say basement, it's not like, oh, it's nice, back in the days. Right, it's a cellar, okay? So when it snows, there is no heat. How we get heat? We open the door for the boiler to, to get the heat, okay? So it really, really was terrible. And I lived there for 10 years. My mom was so uh, uh, nerve wracking about paying the rent because without the rent, we could be on the street. It's just that simple back in the days. And, uh, uh, so, after 10 years, we lived in the basement, all of a sudden my dad showed up and said, uh, said to my mom, you got to look for a house because, uh, you know, we want to buy those, uh, those ones with the, uh, you know, with the uh, second and third floor, they are paying for, the, for our, uh, for our uh, mortgage. So then we end up buying two of them. We negotiated and then we bought it. Uh, 290,000 for two of them, uh, so 580,000. And my father was very, very keen on the real estate because that time Taiwanese currency, uh, you know, it used to be one dollar equals 40, but uh, that year it became one dollar equals 22 dollars, Taiwan dollar. So, and then he, he told us, I still remember 1994, the Chinese are coming. Okay, at that time it was a lot of Taiwanese people, but then, you know, you know, Chinese just moved to Flushing in drones, and the real estate went up five five folds. Okay, but my father was able to see that, and he, he told my mom the third thing. Okay, so the first thing is, you know, buy the triplex, don't buy one floor. Second thing, Chinese are coming. Third thing, put it in, don't put it in our name, put it in the children's name, because to avoid inheritance tax. Right, so me and my brother, uh, you know, we have our retirement plan already. But my mom, she's collecting the rent and all that. So then, every but the, the, it's great for my mom, but it sucks for me because every time evicting tenants, it was me. <laughs> right, I go to the court, I evict these tenants, okay, because I speak English, and you know the tenants would play games, would be sobbing in front of the judge, and then. You know, all of a sudden they get away with, you know, six months easy. Okay, I had a one tenant. He he was he was uh, in the hallway. He point to my nose and say, Isaac, I'm gonna leave next month. But just remember, I'm doing you a favor. He owe me three months. And my attorney, uh, I was so upset. I was like holding my fist. My, I was so upset. And my attorney, home, you know, grabbed me to the side. Said, He's right. He can you know, easily stay for six months. So don't say anything, he will leave. So that's how bad the, 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 the law is mm -hmm. in New York. Yeah. Yeah, so, so that was my story. You know, I, I started the real estate hating real estate. Right, right. Okay, but then, you know, I got laid off and then, and then I got back into real estate again. My mom said, why don't you, you know, manage our home property? And, and, and then I said, I'm not putting a dime here. So I start venture out into the, into other states got it wow that's so inspiring 
Wow, so it sounds like you had, I mean, you had, you had a really tough upbringing. You migrated, immigrated to the U.S. from Taiwan at an early age. Um, living conditions, not the ideal, but, you know, you made it through with your grit. Sounds like your family was all in it. And you got exposed to um, real estate, you know, how, how to be a landlord uh, by accident and ended up hating it. But what made you want to go back? to real estate investing, you know, if you had such a negative experience in the beginning? You know, uh, IT business, it changes very fast. Mm -hmm. And when, um, uh, I mean, without getting too much into technology, uh, you have to put in, you know, a lot more investment into the business. Um, and sometimes, you know, when something like a financial crisis comes, you don't know if those money will ever come back, okay? So um, I sold the, my equity in the business, okay? I took the money back home to New York from Dubai, and I used those money as a C money. To, I, first I paid, you know, $20,000 or whatnot. I don't, yeah, I think it's $20,000 to take the course to learn how to manage the managers, right? You want to, you know, grow the business the proper way um, and then the next thing is, it's always been my backyard. Now you got to go out, right? And then, uh, you know, uh, look at the property and decipher which one is the good one versus the bad one. Because, you know, I don't have friends there. You know, I'm in the middle of uh, uh, Midland, Texas. That was my first stop. Fossil fuel. I look out in the data, you know, we, we business people, we, uh, we research the data. Fossil fuel. You know, 2.8% unemployment rate for 18 year old. Why? I went there, I stayed in the motel for eight days. Okay, just talking to, you know, uh, the people locally. Why? How? You know, it, it, you know, basically, you know, fossil fuel was in the beginning stage. Uh, you know, uh, US was the developing technology and they were set to overtake Saudi Arabia having the oil. Then I said, boy, I have found the gem, right? Man, this is it. And then I bought, I started with a seven unit, right? You know, I wanted to, I, I, you know, started with seven unit and it was awesome. $147 went the barrel oil. Six months later, bang, $37. The whole town disappeared, okay? And my tenant disappeared too. From seven tenant down to three and half price. I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? And, and to, to, to Midland, Texas from New York, it's you take a flight to Houston, right? And then you take this tiny little flight, okay, that takes seven people and then go to Midland, Texas. So one way, it's about eight hours, okay, for a seven unit property. It was grueling. And I hired the property management company. They were terrible because the whole town is dependent on oil. Nobody cares. So I sold the business. Uh, yeah, but uh, that was, you know, the beginning of my multifamily journey. Then, I, you know, I, I, I said, oh, I, I sold it for, for, for a loss. Okay. But I learned the lesson. Then I went into Ohio, Cincinnati. I started with, I, I bought 23 units. Then that did okay, but you know the return was not good. You know, too many, you know, uh, what do you say? Um, you know, the economy was not in my favor. Then I, that's when I crossed the river. I went to uh, Florence, Kentucky, Northern Kentucky. That's where the, all the Amazon, you know, thing was going. And I said, hey, this is great. And I start, you know, just just collecting, buying and buying, you know, uh, making uh, connections locally and start buying the right properties. You know, that when I reached about 100, I said, hey, I want to diversify. That I, that's when I went to uh, uh, South Carolina mm. and I bought another 100. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's now, it's, uh, you know, job, job, jobs, man. Job, job, jobs. Yeah. What, what year was it when you, you know, entered Texas and, you know, sold those properties? Those properties. Good question. So, I 2008 know. was, was, um, uh, Lehman, right? Mm -hmm. And then everybody's scared, right? And then I started buying in 2012. Okay. 14, 15, 17, 18. 
I stopped. Right. Because I thought it's about 10 to 12 years historically, right? The, mm-hmm. From the troll to the peak. Then, you know, uh, so I, I purchased all the way and then I stopped in 2019. But who, who would have known COVID, you know, come and then, you know, I mean, I would have bought more, but uh, yeah, COVID, it's, uh, it's, it's a big, big X, big question mark. Yeah. So, I mean, like your Texas rental uh, the portfolio, it sounds like you had a pretty terrible experience as well. What kept you going after that? And now you have like three digits, 170 uh, units across those three markets, right? What was it that kept you going? That's because to me, that's like I could see people quitting after, you know, going through something like that, right? Right, right. Well, I mean, you know, you see people, right? They, they do well. Okay, well, actually, I had a mentor. His name is Chris Urso. Mm. You know, and, and you know, he, he owned, at that time, under his belt, he was a syndicator, but uh, he owned about 200 at the time. Uh, and I see if he can do it, you know, why can't I? Um, you know, uh, his advice was that you don't need to look for the best market, okay, but you need to have the good location, okay? It's about living, so it's not about, you know, finding the gold. So I started looking for a good market and then, and then that's the macro level. And then you look at the micro level, uh, you know, the good, uh, good property. Uh, I mean, usually, you know, you look at maybe 50 apartments and you make offer for 10 and then you, you, you end up with one, you know, cause you win on the buy. Hmm. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I never gave up. I just kept going. Yeah. So it sounds like you had you surrounded yourself with people that have succeeded in that in that area and be, even though you didn't see the success right away you had a mentor that kind of guided you so that you kept believing no like i can still succeed which you did clearly so yeah, but yeah. back in the days yeah. it was very 2012 it was disaster so there was only a few people who was able to claim success though it's not like today. Today, everybody is talking about, wow, you know, I have this wild success. Yeah, back in the days, it was 10 cap and nobody cared about multifamily. I know, right? I mean, like, I remember after the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, people didn't want to do with real estate at all. So, you know, back, like in hindsight, people are like, oh man, I should have bought more properties back then. But people are scared, like seriously scared. And, you know, everything was uncertain. So... Well, kudos to you, taking action and just kept going. It really shows that, you know, it takes uh, patience and um, yeah, you, you, you go through some bad experiences, right? But that, well, that's what, what, what I think accelerated the success is that in America, there is 1031 exchange where other countries don't. Right. Right. Okay. And uh, you between debt financing and 1031 exchange, that really kept the snowball hmm. effect. Okay, I have here on my wall this. I keep reminding myself. Do you know what this is? Infinite. Yeah. Infinity. Yeah. How do you artificially, right? You buy a property and then you artificially value add the property and then pull your money back and put on the next one. Yeah. That is the craft. Mm-hmm. Okay. So between you know uh, getting the a good property that has the potential to go up and pull the money up and then go for the next one that's the secret sauce you know you asked me before you know i'm not as successful as you are but hey listen buddy i started where you were but you know it's that infinity mindset how do i pull the money up out and then go for the next one that makes a big difference right so the success just compounded compounded and then it just kept getting getting bigger that's awesome. And so you talked about your retirement. You retired at age, did you say 47, you 49? 49. 49, yeah, okay. So how, how did you, you know, <laughs> retiring early, it's a, it's a big conversation as well. What, what is it like and how did you know, like did you have a number uh, of like monthly cash flow or net worth or whatever that might be? How did you uh, decide on your retirement? Well, I mean, it's a pretty simple mathematic equation, right? You have your expense, 
okay? And you calculate that expense, uh, you know, it goes up and down. So my monthly expense for my family is $6,000. Mm -hmm. $6,000. That's, we live kind of frugal. Then, uh, you know, we find ways to increase that passive income. Sometimes passive income goes down, sometimes goes up. But there is a point in time when every month you exceed 6000 mm -hmm. Okay? You know, without realizing, I went to 10000 Okay? It was well exceeded. I, I didn't have to work anymore. Mm -hmm. I just have to make sure the meetings uh, happen. And I manage those people, uh, manage the managers. I mean, you know, and then you realize, boy, I got to get another hobby. Or I got to find something to do because I don't need to work for a living, mm -hmm. right? Um, I just have to, you know, make sure that the people around me work, you know, and I treat them fairly, right? So uh, I still, I when I acquired the property, I used to, when the, during the renovation phase, I go there every month. Mm -hmm. Then it slows down to three months. Then now I go once a year, like Lauren did. Because you go there, what do you go there for? It's unlike when you own, you know, two, three units, we have 200 units. It's all about P&L statement, the financial statement. You look at it and you see it's 95%, you know, you, you know, you, uh, you know, give and take, uh, you know, you have the repair, you have the whatever, right? You have a historical data and based on that, you know, things are doing fine. As long as above 93, when it comes down to 93, then I'm a little bit concerned. Mm -hmm. The I calculated the threshold is 72, 70 to 72, and the you know debt usually is about 45 percent to 50 percent. So you kind of know the figure, right? And then you look. Who cares? You you fix a toilet, you fix a sink, you know it's their business, right? You just make sure that the manager company treats you fairly. And you, you know, once in a while, if I feel like it, I pop up. I visit the place without not, not, uh, notifying them. Mm -hmm. I say, hey, I'm just here to say hi. Yeah. So they don't know if I'm showing up or not, but they're doing a decent job. And, you know, and, and, and I, I live, you know, I live uh, another lifestyle, right? So that's how I was able to travel 21 days to, to Taiwan, Japan, and, uh, and Cambodia and I think three weeks ago before that I went to Lisbon I went to Spain and then two weeks before I went to Taiwan again so I mean now it's pretty regular so I can you know at the end of the year I'm going to uh, Las Vegas with my family you know so uh, I mean we're not we're not living like you know living large but we don't have to worry about life Wow that's amazing so you started buying again in did you say 2020 12 and then when did you retire uh 49 so 2019 19 so that's wow like seven years so in seven years you, you build up basically uh, in, from in 2010 yeah. and 2012 i i i did do a student housing i had a student housing business yeah. uh i made a you know duplex and then i i, I rented out by the room yeah and i used that for the final 1031 exchange because I practiced my craft, right? I went from seven units all the way to 80 and then the home run was now I have learned everything, okay? So I sold my business with the building, the duplex in, in Queens and then bang, I bought an 80 unit property outright and you know, uh, and I was very comfortable with the purchase. Wow, okay. So would you say like in about 10 years, you basically went from zero to what is it? How many units? 170 right now? 174. 174. I mean, that's like everyone's dream. What would you say to someone who's starting out? Obviously, like people want like, oh, I can't wait 10 years. But like, hey, it's not a get rich, get rich quick scheme. We've been talking about it. But for those who have the patience to wait 10 years to get to where you are, what can they do now? Like, what do they need to have? What kind of mindset, character um, do they need to have? And capital. You know, a lot of people, they like to syndicate. Okay, one thing that I feel very uncomfortable was a lot of people talk about no money down. 
Let's do a no money down deal. Let's use other people's money. That's something that I, I never really, you know, uh, uh, you know, bought. Mm -hmm. um, I always try to do debt financing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I borrow from my aunt. I borrow from my mom. I borrow a lot from the bank. And I even borrow from credit card when they had a 0% interest promotion to do the repairs. The reason is I try to keep the equity to myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, as the business gets bigger, it's hard. You, you, you can't do that forever. So I would have JV. I would not do syndication. Too many problems and everybody have different ideas. Somebody want to get out early, whatever. JV. Shu, you are the logo boots on the ground. And, and, and I'm a partner with a lot of experience. Let's do it. Okay. And we have the common understanding of long term. We're going to either debt refi, pull money out and achieve infinity, or we're going to 1031 and go something bigger. Mm -hmm. It's never about sell something to buy a Lamborghini. Mm -hmm. No touch. Yeah. My, yeah, no touch that money. That's the C money. That's the golden goose. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, I tell you, 95% of people, they, 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 but when it times the time, right? You make some money, then, you know, they, they, they. They, you know, they start killing the goose, right. so to speak. Right, right, right. right. So, or, Shu, you have a different skill set. You are a carpenter, or you are a construction guy, or you are a developer, or you are an accountant. We have a different skill set. Let's partner up. Okay, but we got to have the same mentality. Okay, so, yeah, so that's, that's uh, you know, uh, that's my philosophy is, you know, don't give out equity easily. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, it's easier to partner, mm -hmm. but with the right kind of partnership. Yeah. Got it. Awesome. Thanks for that. That's, yeah, that was like my personal question and it's super inspiring. I mean, you're in the US, you mainly uh, primarily invest in uh, several markets in the US, and now you're looking at other markets. Um, in Asia. So you talked about Taiwan, Cambodia, and Japan briefly. So walk me through, you know, after your retirement, obviously you're, you know, you're not hustling as much, but you're looking into where you can allocate your resource, you allocate your equity capital um, for, you know, longer wealth building strategy, right? So yeah, could you walk me through what you're thinking? What's your next next goal and next step and what um what's what do you think about the japanese market so as you know right now u.s there's a standoff the interest rate for commercial loan it's seven to eight percent yeah okay you could do a cd for five percent today so you know there's nobody you know the seller won the price yesterday's price mm -hmm. the buyer wants the huge discount yeah. so there's no deal yeah. Okay, I try my hand and, and it's just the return is horrible. Okay, so um, that's uh, so a, a friend of mine, uh, Ken, uh, he came to me and said, Isaac, I'm buying some land in Florida, uh, Kissimmee, Orlando. And I said, Man, why would I want to buy land? He said, Isaac, it's funny, right? Because you could buy a multifamily, okay, and you buy a land, and when you build a multifamily, the price is actually cheaper than the current multifamily because the current multifamily is so overpriced. I said, are you serious? And then, you know, Ken showed me the math, and I said, boy, you have a new construction, and then you have about 10 years of no repair. This is a good business. So he, he got into the land business, and then I invested with him, right? And I got to understand land business is about approval, certificates. You buy a farmland in a good location, right? And this farmland gets approval for the water and sewer, the price goes up. This farmland gets commercial approval to build houses, the price goes up. This farmland goes, you know, gets approval for, uh, what is that called? Townhouses, price goes up. Ultimately, the property gets approval for multifamily. The price goes way up. 
Now, Ken, he is good at this paperwork. The right attorney. You know, he's a Jewish guy. And he's, you know, he's a, he, he knows that, you know, these things. So, so that's another whole business. And then that opened my eyes. Boy, you don't always have to go do it by yourself. You could give it to them and then you just watch it happen. So that's how I started investing in land in Taiwan and also now in Cambodia. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned about Japanese. That's a whole different ballgame. Okay. Let's talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, uh, I gave my, you know, uh, my wife, uh, I gave my wife to buy a, a condo. Okay, in, in, in Fukuoka City, because, you know, she, uh, she uh, always wanted to own something in Japan. So I said, hey, you know, then I steadily, I found out the interest is like 1.5%, okay, or lower. lower. You know, if you are lowering, you get lower, okay. Yeah. So uh, I said, 1.5%, I mean, how does that work? He said, yeah, you got to uh, pay the taxes and you got to register a company locally in Japan and you could do it all the any foreigner or, uh, or national Japanese national can do it I said boy let me look into this so I I talked to uh, a bro another broker uh, commercial broker uh, yeah commercial property broker and then you know uh, uh, if I could show I can share the screen yeah please so he showed me a this property okay so, because in our conversation, uh, by the way, this is a 29 studio. It's a solid metal building, right? Mm -hmm. uh, with a store in the bottom, uh, selling for 2.5 mil. Okay, and you can borrow up to 80% at 1.5% uh, <laughs> interest. Right. Okay, and funny, in, uh, in Japan, People like studio or one bedrooms. Yeah. yeah. You know, all the, uh, it's not like in US, uh, the, uh, they like, you know, the professionals, uh, the, the white color job, they, they, you know, they like to live in these kind of uh, uh, shoe box. Okay. So 29 units, mm -hmm. it's four minutes, it's four, uh, sorry, it's in Japanese. Okay. Uh, it's a four minutes to JR station. It's very important. To close to the station yeah but for japanese it's even more important usually within 10 minutes yeah that your yeah. price will stay high mm -hmm. if it's anything above then the price gets iffy okay so it's four minutes and then one minute to the bus bus tape right yoshizuka nichome bus tape and then this so the for the people who knows fukuoka city okay so this is quite convenient and the return is 5.12%, okay? It's okay, yeah. so so. Yeah. But you gotta consider the 1.5% interest is also on top of this, right? Through, you know, the, the way the, the bank lends is, usually the way they calculate the building is 47 years. Actually, the building lasts more than 47 years, but the bank only lends up to 47 years. So that's why Lauren, he became my good friend now, he said, if anything that's over 30 years, the bank won't even lend you. So you look for a 20 year building. For example, this is uh, 2000, 2000, and then they will lend you the rest, right? So it's, if it's a 20 unit building, then they lend you 27 years at 1.5%, which is awesome, right? Now they're, okay. So, but in Japan, um, okay. so. In Japan, if I can go here, I wrote something for you, for your audience too. Yeah. Let's go for the cons, right? The pros and the cons. Can you see it? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, okay. that's that's great. Yeah, perfect. There is no 1031 exchange law. Yeah, in <laughs> only in the U.S. Right. Yeah. So that's a big blow, right? Second is pro tenant. It is. Okay. Yeah. It's not as bad as you know. People are not like crazy like New York. So you know they are still they're still decent. But according to my conversation with the broker, is that they have something, they use something in insurance, which Lauren also mentioned. Lauren pays about 10 bucks per unit, per door, okay? So there's pro-tenant, okay? 
and then they prefer new property. Mm -hmm. But as long as the property is location is near the station, I think you're good there, but not too old. Right. right. Okay. Now uh, the pros is that obviously it's one point five percent interest, and that's a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. From today, right? We're looking at eight. Seven. Yeah. Everywhere else, yeah. right? That's probably the lowest in the world right now. I know. Yeah. I know. Right. So, and it's an unknown market. I talked to the broker. I said to the broker, um, is it okay I speak a little Japanese? I yes. said, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So then it's ah, ito, ito, ito bill, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Then you are done this, yo, Bokua. So I said, yeah, yeah, we want to buy ito means one building. Mm -hmm. So they don't have, you know, in US we have, you know, you know, spread out, but they have one building, one building, one building for sale. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the third thing, which I covered up. I like it. <laughs> you kept it a surprise. Because, yeah. you know, I was in a semiconductor business. Right. I used to work for Intel, by the way. Okay. Okay. Mm. And, Hanto Tai. Mm. It's Hanto Tai. Why? In 90s, US uh, levy 100% tariff on Japanese semiconductor. So the Toshiba, the NEC, Panasonic, they went all the way down and they propped up uh, Korean, Samsung, LG, and Taiwan. Right? The technology is U.S. technology. So then, now China is coming up. They say, hey, listen, we want to bring back Japan. That was the agreement, Biden. So they're building something Kumamoto mm. in uh, Kyushu. Mm -hmm. And that's going to drive the economy. So mark my words, five years later, you're going to see Japanese economy go up. But however, there is a big concern is the population. Right. Right, the population going down fast. But also, you know, I, I was there and I asked a lot of the, first of all, there are a lot more foreigners there, you know, people from uh, Nepal, uh, Philippines, and, you know, they're, they're you know, in the 7 Eleven or the restaurant working. So they are relaxing the, 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 the law. And let me see if I have this up. My buddy sent me this, this interesting uh, article. All Japanese prefectures. Re Oh, can you see it? Mm -hmm. Except Fukuoka. And Fukuoka last year, 13,000 uh, people in increased population. So I asked Tanaka-san, right? I said, Tanaka-san, uh, you know, why the population in Fukuoka increased? What's the reason? He said, before Corona, a lot of Chinese investors came to invest. Okay. But after Corona, they have their own problems. Okay. Now, a lot of people from Tokyo came to invest. Mm -hmm. And with the, you know, uh, with the open up of the, uh, a lot of Taiwanese people as well, they open up the, uh, the immigration, okay? You don't get citizenship easily. It's hard, okay? But to work visa, it's not hard, okay? They're opening up gradually. So with Fukuoka City, you know, with, uh, I mentioned before, Southeast Asia is booming and uh, a lot of people is going to be coming to Japan. You know, everybody likes Japan, you know, for the excellence and the quality, you know, the, the closest and most friendly is Fukuoka City, mm -hmm. business friendly. So also the people in Tokyo, they're paying, you know, uh, they're paying so much, you know, for a uh, little shoebox. So they also come to Fukuoka. They skip Osaka for the obvious reason that it's expensive there as well. So now they come to Fukuoka. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, between a lot of good factors. Okay. But uh, for any of uh, you know your audience, if they have something information they like to share, you know, because obviously I haven't done the business there. I'm still in the process of you know, researching and, 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 and I like my wife's family to get involved in the multifamily real estate mm -hmm. as well, yeah. you know, because yeah. we have the know-how, right? So, uh, yeah. So, you know, uh, if they have something, please share with us. Uh, absolutely. I did a um, video on the, the top five markets to invest in Japan and 
top one was Fukuoka. I chose Fukuoka as the 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 top. The population thing was one of them. I personally love Fukuoka. Kyushu is probably my favorite I'm island. Down, man. Yeah. Well, I'm, my my family, my ancestors are from Kyushu, and I've, oh, I I yeah. love just different parts of Kyushu. Um, and uh, right after that. Huh? Ipudo, 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 yeah, exactly. In, in US, they're selling for $25 uh, oh, right now in Manhattan. Oh, man, Ichiran, Ipudo, it's all from uh, Fukuoka. That's insane, you know. man. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, but uh, it makes sense. So, you know, you're really looking into it with everything that's happening in the, uh, the housing market in the US. Uh, I don't know if when the rent, uh, interest rates will come down. They may not never be, you know, below three, below four, right? It might stay around like six or five or something like that. I don't and think so. Yeah, I think it's going to be like about five percent and yeah. just stay there. Yeah, and it, it's so competitive. Like so many, there are so many podcasts, so many YouTube channels that talk about real estate investing in, in the U.S. And, uh, you know, very experienced investor like yourself is looking at Japan, some parts of Japan. What do you think it's, um, what would you say to those who are interested in investing in Japan, but don't know too much about the market or what to do, what would you say coming from an experienced uh, investor? Well, um, or if you live in Japan and you are a foreigner, you know, don't let it stop you. you yeah. know, talk to brokers who are in the commercial real estate. And uh, uh, because I think right now is a very good timing. A lot of people, you know the locals they don't they they hate real estate and the foreigners they don't know mm -hmm. so it's a pretty good timing uh and uh, talk about you know uh, maybe you need to form an llc you know uh and then uh you know uh, talk about how you're gonna get lending and uh, uh you know start small right uh maybe you can get a i don't know triplex which is not not very expensive and then have management company manage it um, I would really recommend, bef you know, in the same time, you would take some kind of course to know how to underwrite. It's, you know, probably a weekend. Know how to underwrite so you understand, you know, the numbers. Everything is about the numbers, okay? Um, yeah, start small and, uh, you know, grow gra go up gradually, like mm -hmm. I did. Yeah, so you, you think Japan is a good market, actually, to start investing? In I think Fukuoka is a good market. Fukuoka is a good market, yeah. But from New York, it's too far because I gotta, you know, there's no direct flight and I gotta go through like, you know, some a third, another country. Personally, I'm not the type of person, it's, it's, everybody's different. I'm not the type of person to spend a lot of time and money in Akia. I know you talk a lot about Akia, but I just think, imagine you could, because your mental, let's say you buy three units and next thing you buy 10 units next thing you buy because 10 units and eight and 80 units it's the same it's the same it's it's a lot of times it's your skill and your mindset mm -hmm. right yeah so yeah. today you can give me 200 units i said no problem yeah. it's the same yeah. NOI, yeah. right uh, so uh, i would you know uh, as a business owner i would go for uh you know owning these buildings and uh, the important thing is how do you get that 1.5 percent you know you get that 0.8 percent from lauren if you're lauren that's uh, that's one of the income stream mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know find a good location and uh, you know uh in five years you can even trade up yeah, yeah. trade up meaning you know you trade you own a 10 unit and then Five years, you sell, you you buy another one. Mm -hmm. You know that's maybe you know twenty, thirty units. Yeah, totally. Yeah, i the more I recently published a video about like how I was wrong about Japanese market because I was so bullish on the U.S. market because that's you know I I knew about the market better even though I'm Japanese and live in Japan. But the more I know, you know, the more I talk to investors like Laurent, Colin, and yourself. I'm like, huh, it's actually, it could be a really good market as long as you find the right location, right? And it's easier than ever uh, because the competition is so low. Like you said, people in Japan don't invest in real estate. Yeah, uh, 
Let's keep it a secret, yeah. <laughs> but for real though, yeah, the competition is so low. So if you know a little, or if you have the courage to take risks and get into it, you know, the chances are you might succeed. And even if you fail in the first deal, just get up, get back up and keep going, right? Because the experience is the best lesson that you can get. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, Isaac, um, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I learned so much, first of all. And more importantly, your story is incredibly inspiring. And I think it inspires a lot of people that are watching this. Um, where can people find out more about you? Well, first of all, congratulations on the second baby. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. My yeah. son is 15 years old. I, you know, I miss those times so much. Yeah. You know, yeah. even though that time I was like, oh, baby crying. But I tell you, I mean, it's nothing like, you know, your own, you know, child. It's amazing. But uh, yeah, you can reach me through um, LinkedIn. I, I S A A C last name C H I A N G and Facebook. Okay, it's commercial real estate investor. Okay, LinkedIn, and uh, uh, my email is i s double a c n y c three five one six at yahoo.com. Great, I'll put all that into the description below, so people who are interested in reaching out to you, do business with you, they can reach out um, that way. Thank you. Cool. Well, Isaac, thanks again for your time, and uh, best of luck. I. I'd love to meet you in person one day. Yeah, you know, I'm in New York. Look me up. Yeah, we'll do. All right. Thank you. If you want to connect with Isaac, I will link his contact information in the show notes below. I hope you enjoyed this video. This was my first time interviewing someone online for the channel. So if you want to see more content like this or know someone you think I should interview, let me know in the comment below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Finally, make sure to download the free guide how to buy an Akia in Japan as a foreigner and watch this video next for more. Make sure you own your financial future because if you don't, someone else will. See you in the next one.